So if, if you've got young kids, you probably have Legos. And if you have Legos, you definitely have trauma in the house. And I'm not just talking about the blunt force trauma to the foot that happens when you step on them barefoot, um, but also the, the emotional trauma that your child experiences when he invests lots and lots of time um, building the biggest tower he can possibly build only to see it tip over and then shatter into dozens of pieces. And if you have young kids, you know the emotional meltdown that comes with experiencing a loss like that. And now what do parents often say to their kids when the tower falls? Right? They say things like, it's okay, sweetheart, it's, it's just Legos. It's just Legos. Right? But to the child, it's not just Legos, is it? It's a lot more than that. It's, like, it's, it's a lifelong investment. It's like everything they've poured themselves into. From their perspective, it's the sum total of life's work up until this point uh, in their existence. Everything's just destroyed before their very eyes. It's not an insignificant loss, which is why they melt down when the tower falls and shatters. So we see that in, in our kids. But you know, as adults... We're not that different. We experience loss just like our kids do. We, we work really hard on projects that are just frustrated and fail. They don't work out the way we want them to. We lose jobs. Right? The mower breaks down before you finish the yard. The car gets wrecked. Investments tank. Health declines. Relationships that we pour lots into, they disintegrate. And if we're honest, we don't always handle our loss much better than the way that our kids handle their losses, right? We come apart too, we lose all hope, and we look at some of these losses and we see absolutely no purpose in it, right? We see no meaning in this. This is just purposeless suffering. We can't possibly imagine anything good coming out of this experience that we just experience day in and day out in life? Is there really any meaning to the loss that we face in this life? How do we think about that? And that's what Solomon is addressing here in Ecclesiastes 7. He's teaching us how to make sense of and how to deal with loss, how to think about it, how to process it, how to go through life with all of the loss we experience and to do it well. Is there meaning in all of this suffering and pain and loss that we experience in life? And the burden of these opening 14 verses here in chapter 7 is Solomon's to, to, to be able to say, yes, there's meaning, there's purpose to this. You're not just drifting and being bounced here and there randomly and it just hurts for no reason at all. There's purpose in it. There's meaning to it. And, and here's how he's going to develop that answer. He's going to give us two truths about this life to help us make sense of loss. Two very simple truths if you just stop and think about it. Number one, the good times aren't all good. And number two, the bad times aren't all bad. If you can grasp those two principles... And if you can grasp them in light of Christ, you're going to be able to make sense of loss. Whatever kind of loss it might be in whatever way we go through it in this life. So let's start unpacking that, beginning with the good times that we experience in life. According to Solomon, the good times aren't all good. They're not all good. First of all, that's true because even the good times still have adversity mixed in with it. It's never purely good. It's never entirely enjoyable. Uh, maybe the clearest articulation of that is in verse 10. Look at what he says. He says, Say not, why were the former days better than these? For it's not from wisdom that you ask this. This is kind of like the lyrics from the Billy Joel song, the good old days were always good. 
we often attribute to those good old days far more good than they actually had. Now, because, because even the good old days, they still had their fair share of problems. Although we, we typically downplay them, right? We, we omit them. We don't like to think about them. We want to have memories of the happy times. And, and we can so formulate memories of previous events that all we see are the happy things and we forget about all the stuff we had to deal with in the meantime. If you've ever taken a family photo, you know exactly what I'm talking about here. The other day we had our, our annual peep battle at our house. Um, so you know what peeps are? You know the peep candy. It's basically a sugar-coated marshmallow in the shape of something. Uh, uh, for, uh, you know, at, at Easter time, it's in the shape of a, of a chick or, or a bunny. And so what we do is, is I draw up a bracket. We have eight people in our house, so the bracket works pretty good. Um, and we have two people per round, and, and, we, and we each choose a peep, and we insert a toothpick into the peep, and then each of those people, they, they, they place the peeps with the toothpicks kind of like a sword drawn out against the other peep, and we put them on a plate, and then we put them in the microwave. And what happens is, in about 45 seconds, the marshmallows expand, right? And um, we see which peep stabs the other peep first. This actually happens in our household, right? And the winner of that match gets to advance to the... We even had double elimination in this thing. It was intense. It was great. It was, it's become a family tradition. We, we have a good time. And that's about the only way you can actually enjoy peeps. If you try eating them, it's very difficult to actually enjoy them long term. But if you see them explode in the microwave, there's more fun there. Right? So this is a family tradition. But of course, it's not all fun. Because when you have a competition, some people win and some people lose. And we're a competitive household, and, you know, kids can be competitive. Losing's hard. Tears are involved. And so we have this wonderful tradition that we have. And, and as a dad, I feel like my job is to, to um, immortalize these m memories and moments with pictures and videos. <clears throat> and like a good dad photographer, I'm trying to angle the camera to only capture the smiling, winning faces and not the people that are bawling and, and losing it and are uncontrollable here in the corner, right? Disappointed faces when their peep gets run through with the toothpick. That's what we do, though, as dads. We just want a picture of the happy times. And it's a happy time. We have a great time with that as a family. But it's not purely happy. There's adversity even in that. Somebody's got to lose. Somebody's got to deal with loss. And I bet I'm not the only one who does that. So just, I bet if you went through some of your family photos right now, and you looked at some of those wonderful, happy moments of everybody smiling and everything looks great, I bet you could probably remember some things about that day or about that time that wasn't so happy, right? That family vacation, that group picture, we finally got everybody together, took it. You forgot about earlier in the week when the kid had to go to the trauma center because they cut their leg or stepped on a nail, right? Or you've got maybe the picture of the championship uh, win, right? But you forget, well, you struck out twice in that game and it was just devastating until we got to the end of it. Or perhaps the graduation picture where everybody's smiling and beaming, but you remember looking at that during the commencement speech, thinking about that college that you didn't get into or something that happened that week that just put a, a bit of a cloud over top of that e even the good times immortalized in these wonderful pictures even those good times they've got adversity mixed in with them it's never purely good Solomon says this in a number of different ways through the passage look at verse 1 he says a, a good name is better than precious ointment the day of death is better than the day of birth and that, that's, a, that's a striking statement, isn't it? I think what he means by that is, is, is so pervasive are the, the difficulties we all face that a person who's about to end this life is kind of in a better position than the person who's about to begin it and go through all of that loss and trauma and difficulty. At least the guy facing death doesn't have to deal with that anymore. He says something similar in verse 8, better is the end of a thing than the beginning of it. 
So even the good times have adversity mixed in. But, but more than that, the good times, Solomon says, they're not always good. They're not entirely good because often the, the good times don't produce good things. The, the good prosperous times don't always produce good. Prosperity could be a wonderful, wonderful thing in life. And, you know, Solomon's not a masochist. He doesn't, he doesn't get pleasure from pain. He's not saying we should uh, eschew any kind of blessings that God gives us. But what he's saying is prosperity can not just be a wonderful thing. It can be a great temptation, a great temptation to sin. It could, it could be a gateway into a lot of bad stuff. Now, like, like verse 7, it can lead to corruption. It can lead to oppression. Verse 8, it can lead to impatience and pride. Verse 9, both of these phenomena can lead to just anger and cynicism and resentment. Unless this, this prosperity that we get throughout life is, is coupled and tempered with and put in the context of the wisdom of viewing life from a God-centered, from what we've called it above the sun perspective, prosperity is not going to produce good in a person's life. And so Solomon says, wisdom is good with an inheritance and advantage to those who see the sun. For the protection of wisdom is like the protection of money, and the advantage of knowledge is that wisdom preserves the life of him who has it. But of course, not everybody has it. Not everybody who experiences the prosperity and the good things in life treat it with wisdom. They exploit it. Which is why the good times don't always produce good. Oftentimes they produce just the opposite. And so, no, the good times aren't all good. Billy Joel was right, at least on that. They often include loss. And they often produce more loss. But now there's a flip side to all this. Yes, the good times, they're not all good. But Solomon also says the bad times aren't all bad. And this is so counterintuitive for us because nobody likes the bad times in life. Nobody enjoys suffering when we're going through it. But what Solomon is saying here, just to state it positively, is that, that God works good things, really good things, even through the bad things. Which means... Suffering is never meaningless. It's never pointless. It's, it's never just going nowhere. It's never just like inexplicably bad. Although it feels that way, especially when we're going through it, it's never that. At least not when viewed from an above the sun, a, a God-centered perspective. Look at the suffering, or looking at suffering from a a godless, what we call an under-the-sun perspective will, will never yield any meaning in the loss whatsoever. And will never do that. Because remember we talked about this weeks ago as Solomon began this book. And we consider that quote from Richard Dawkins. He's an atheist. He's looking at life from that godless, what Solomon calls an under-the-sun perspective. And, and here's how he describes the, 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 um, the fruitlessness of trying to find meaning in pain. Dawkins says, in a universe of electrons and selfish genes, blind physical forces and genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt and other people are going to get lucky, and you're not going to find any rhyme or reason in it. Because the universe doesn't care about you. The universe doesn't give a rip about you. The universe doesn't care about anything because it's impersonal. Right? In, in a universe like that, there is no meaning to pain or pleasure or anything else. Dawkins is entirely right if the, if the suffering and the loss that we experience is simply the result of just random, purposeless chance events in an impersonal universe. No, there's no meaning in that. So stop looking for it. Just, just grit your teeth and bear it. Right? There, there's no meaning in suffering under the sun because under the sun, there's no God to give that meaning. Right? There's no God to give it. 
But that's not the universe that Solomon is, is presenting to us here. That's not reality. Dawkins' idea of the universe does not correspond to the way things really are. He's not absent from the universe. He's certainly not absent from the suffering that goes on in his universe. Okay, the universe doesn't run and rule itself. God rules. God runs the universe and whatsoever takes place in it, including the adversity. Look at verses 13 and 14. Look at the suffering and look at how God is in control of that too. He says, consider, just, just okay, put your thinking caps on for a second and just think deeply and biblically about loss. Consider the work of God. Who can make straight what he has made crooked? The, the, the crooked here is the adversity. All right? We don't like crooked paths. We try to straighten those paths out, but look, God puts crooked paths in our way, doesn't he? In the day of prosperity, be joyful. Like Enjoy the blessedness that you get in the times of prosperity. And in the day of adversity, of suffering, of pain and loss, consider. So think. Think. God has made the one as well as the other. And notice there's a purpose clause. There's, there's a purpose statement here. He's made the other, namely the adversity, so that man may not find out anything that will be after him. So this, this doesn't get much clearer than this. Solomon considers two types of events that fill the entirety of our lives, okay? Um, the good ones and the bad ones. The, the prosperity and the adversity. The, the happy times and the sad times. The, the pleasure and the pain, okay? And he says unequivocally God's made both. God put both of those in your life. God has made one as well as the other. He says it. And, and what it means is that the loss that we experience in this life, that, that crooked way, that adversity, is not meaningless suffering. It's not random. This is just how life is. God's in control of the adversity too. And he has a good purpose in it, which is why we as Christians can walk through adversity in our lives knowing that God is at work in it. God's not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, oh man, I missed that. I had the hands on the wheel and just lost control there for a bit. Well, this was frustrating my plans. I've exhausted all of heaven's resources trying to, to, to keep you from that and just, well, try next time. That is not the God of the Bible. That is not the God that Solomon presents us with. He's working in the adversity that he brings into your life for his glory and for your good. There's purpose to it. This is not meaningless. Otherwise, this passage just doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense at all. Look, look at what Solomon says beginning in verse 2. Okay? And then ask yourself, how could anything in these verses make sense without the holy sovereign God of the universe bringing about not just the good but also the bad? It's better, Solomon says, to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For this is the end of all mankind. And the living will lay it to heart. Sorrow, sorrow is better than laughter. For by sadness of face the heart is made glad. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning. But the heart of fools is in the house of, of mirth, entertainment, amusement. How could that be? How, how could it be better to attend a funeral than a party? How, how, how could it be better to be sorrowful than to be carrying on and laughing? 
How can mourning be a, a wiser use of our time than amusement? And, and here's how, because in each of the cases here, in each of these cases, the adversity brings us a benefit and a blessing that prosperity simply can't. So I've done a lot of weddings. I've done a lot of funerals. And I can tell you this for a fact. People are much more concerned about the things of eternity when they see a casket than when they see a wedding dress. They're thinking better then in those moments. People at the Super Bowl party aren't thinking about their need for Christ and the joy of, of, of treasuring Him. They're not thinking about that like they are when they're in the ICU. Just think about the, 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 the generational a manifestation of this principle. Just, just think of what we often refer to as the greatest generation in American history, those born between like the uh, 1900 and the, like the late 20s. They're referred to as the greatest generation. They're the ones who went and fought World War II. And uh, what prepared them to do that? What prepared them was not the tremendous of prosperity they enjoyed growing up. That didn't make them ready to do what they did. That didn't make them the greatest generation. It wasn't that. It was being born during and on the heels of a first world war. Going through the fallout of that. Going through the, the, um, the pain and the suffering and the loss of the Great Depression. Going through tough, hard times. Growing up facing adversity left and right. Yeah, there's amusement, there's fun to enjoy, but it's put in the context of the sober realization that this is a fallen world full of loss. That, that honed a generation. That strengthened a generation. That gave them character that we haven't seen in subsequent generations. It was the adversity that made them the great men and women that they were, which is why we call it the greatest generation. That's what developed them and the character and the resolve that enabled them not only to go and to fight World War II, but win it. It's a sad realization that there's, there's a good chance that the generations that we've produced recently wouldn't be able to do that. Not only would they not win it, they probably wouldn't even go. That was born in the context of adversity, not prosperity. So you, you see, God in His goodness and in His grace he designs prosperity and He designs adversity. He, and he designs adversity for all kinds of good purposes that He works through it in our lives. Uh, so Solomon says, getting a rebuke from the wise is better than getting a pat on the back from fools. Right? A rebuke stings. Nobody likes being corrected for their faults and their mistakes. But it's a good thing because in that we get wiser. We get better. Right? The whole principle of, of lifting weights. Right? You, you, you tear the muscle down so that it grows back stronger. That those, those interconnected tissues can bear more weight. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12 that God gave him a thorn in the flesh, some, some chronic pain and suffering and loss that he experienced throughout his life. And he says God gave that to him. God gave that to him for a purpose. It kept him from being conceited because of all the, the strengths Paul had. And it enabled Paul to more clearly see the sufficiency of Christ's grace in his life that he couldn't do it all himself. He was dependent. He was able to see Christ's power being perfected through his weakness and his adversity. The same Paul said a very similar thing in Romans 5. We should rejoice, Paul says, in our suffering. We should be glad that God runs the universe this way, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and that character produces hope. And so this is just mind-blowing if you follow that trajectory of argument. 
whenever you hear God brings about adversity in your life, you think, well, that's hopeless. And what Paul's saying is here, if you gut God from his sovereignty over your adversity, you gut the hope. Because what's the alternative? What's the alternative to God being the one who brings about the adversity you face? Nobody brings it about, and there's no purpose in it. You find that more hopeful? More than that, if God can't prevent your adversity, what in the world makes you think he's going to be able to bring anything good out of it? No, 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 no. Don't run away from this God. Because doing that is to run away from hope in the face of loss. And Solomon is saying that there is much good that comes even from loss. Does, does that mean that we always see it? Certainly when we're going through it, we don't see it. Not always. We may never see it. But what we do see is a faithful God and a track record of doing just this. But this is, this is only... This is only when we view life from an above-the-sun perspective. When we acknowledge God, not just as the giver of adversity, but the giver of meaning to the adversity that we face. As well as the giver of the good that he brings about in and through it. So you see, the, the only way, and this is the only way, there's not another way, this is the only way to make sense of loss in this life. It's to understand that, that prosperity comes from God and so does adversity. And when the prosperity comes, enjoy it and thank God. And, and when the adversity comes, mature through it and thank God. To be able to view all of life, the good and the bad, from a God-centered, above-the-sun perspective. To be able to say, with that wonderful Old Testament example of Job, a guy who knew loss. To be able to say with Job, the Lord gives and he takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Bless him, praise him, thank him, whether he's giving or whether he's taking. So, go back to where we started this morning, right? The advice that we typically give as parents to our kids when the Lego tower falls. Right? What do we say? It's just, it's just Legos. It's just Legos. Hopefully that's not all we say, right? Hopefully we have some empathy. And we put our arm around the kid, right? We show them love. But, but fundamentally, that's the right answer, isn't it? It is, after all, just Legos. That's the right answer for our kids. It's the right answer for us. Even, even the greatest treasures that you lose in this life, they're just Legos. They're just Legos in comparison to the treasure that we have in Christ. And here is the good news of the gospel. That treasure, that treasure will never be lost never be lost and the reason the reason that we'll never lose Christ as our treasure is because of the loss that he experienced for us you understand that right you understand this God who brings about adversity is no mere spectator when it comes to suffering and loss he gave himself for us on the cross he entered this world he entered the suffering he entered the hevel he entered the vanity he entered the, um, the struggle, the adversity, the loss, and he experienced the ultimate loss on the cross so that our sins could be forgiven and, and our eternal treasure absolutely secured in him with his resurrection. And so you see the God we have in Jesus, he's no mere spectator when it comes to your suffering. He's not just looking on. He knows it better than any of us he has suffered in ways that we will never as a believer understand 
which is why we can relate to him and why we can trust him. No matter what loss we might face in this life, it is nothing in comparison to the loss Jesus experienced for us. And it's nothing compared to the gain that we have in him. It's just Legos. It's a matter what we lose. Remember what gain we have in Christ. One of my favorite biblical articulations of this is from our statement of grace in Habakkuk 3. This is the last thing we're going to close here. But before we do, I just want you to hear this. These are the words of a believer in Christ who got it who understood that an above-the-sun perspective takes whatever we lose in this life and, and looks at it in comparison to the gain that we have in Christ. And so as, as we close here, just ask yourself, can you take these words on your lips? Are they an expression of your heart in the ways in which you trust and treasure Jesus above anything that you might lose? on this earth. And, and here it is again. Just listen to every word of Habakkuk 3. Though the fig tree should not blossom. Could you read, just fill in the details. Think of how hard you worked on that to produce the figs. The fig tree doesn't blossom. There's no fruit on the vines. The produce of the olive fails. The fields yield no fruit. The flock is, is cut off from the field. There's no herd in the stalls. Literally everything that you've spent your life working for is gone. Yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will take joy in the God of my salvation. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, that can only be true if you're the God in heaven ruling and reigning over all things. This can only be true if you are our God and our Lord and if you're our strength. And so, make our feet like the deers and make us tread on the high places. Help us to make sense of loss in light of the surpassing gain that we have in you. And it's for your glory in us that we pray and, and our indestructible joy that we have in you. Amen. Amen.